Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all having a great Wednesday. So today is going to be a little bit different because I'm not going to be recording myself, but I am going to introduce a very special guest today. His name is Jason, and he has esophageal cancer. I'm going to let him tell his story about that, but mainly I met him through my channel, and he contacted me a while back and thought that it would be a good idea to do a video together so that we can spread more awareness about cancer and living with it, how to deal with it. He also has his own YouTube channel as well, and he's done a couple of interviews on other channels. Um, and he actually recently did an interview with Dr. Thomas Siegfried, so that was pretty cool. And so I'll link his channel below um, so that you can follow him as well. And I will also be doing an interview on his channel. Uh, but basically, for the purposes of today, we wanted to do a video on mental health surrounding a cancer diagnosis, and we really wanted to talk about the root cause of what we feel caused our cancer, uh, focusing more on the emotional component, but, you know, it'll be kind of uh, just talking about why we think we got the cancer um, and different modalities and things that we did to help ourselves heal through this process. Uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and so it's even a better time to do that because getting a diagnosis is just so devastating. And even if you didn't have mental health issues before the diagnosis, it's like after getting it, you know, it, it, your whole world is shattered and it's really a traumatic process. So I think Jason has really good insight into all of this. And so I will, uh, you know, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jason Watson. Welcome to my channel, Jason. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm pretty excited for today. Uh, me and Nia have been talking for quite a while now, going back and forth. It's almost like we've known each other for a million years already, but <laughs> both yeah. uh, going both going down a similar path, fighting advanced stage cancer and different types of surgeries and recoveries. And, and uh, I think we both found that there's been a lot of issues with the standard of care that we receive from the oncologists and things. And there's a lot of there's a lot more things that we can do to fight this cancer and find tremendous benefit. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. You know, so why don't you start off by just telling them your story, you know, um, your diagnosis and um, how you found out. I mean, just basically, you know, the floor is yours. So you can talk about that. Okay. So yeah, I was diagnosed uh, January 26th of 2023. Uh, with esophageal cancer that had metastasized to my spine, my liver, my lung, my lymph nodes, my pancreas, um, spine, liver, lung, lymph nodes, pancreas. I think that pretty much covers it, and esophagus. Uh, this, the tumor in my esophagus was six centimeters, so it was very large. Um, I hadn't had any issues eating or swallowing as of yet, but those issues were to follow. So that's kind of where I started. I went through tremendous round, uh, three rounds of internal in a, uh, radiation and stretching of my esophagus, which is a lot because it's internal. So internal radiation is quite a bit more potent than external radiation. And then I started chemo in March. Um, I had previously spent a few weeks in the hospital uh, just from the pain. Like it really, once I was diagnosed, this thing came out of the blue. There was no real warning signs ahead of time. It really hit me all of a sudden kind of thing and um, spent a couple of weeks in the hospital. I was in so much pain. I couldn't manage it and I was on a pain pump. And so then in March I started my chemo and almost instantly started having relief and a lot of the symptoms started to go away. And I had very success with good success with chemo for the first three months. Everything had shrunk like 70 to 80%. Everything went extremely well. It was a very good time period. I got off the pain pump. I was able to get out and go golfing with my friends. Um, and then come March, or I guess not at the not March, sorry, come like June, July, a couple times I ate and I had choked and thrown up just a couple times. It wasn't like tremendous or anything. So I didn't think anything of it. I just thought it was damaged scar tissue from the radiation. It could have been anything. I didn't think anything of it. But uh, end of July, my scan showed mixed results. So that would have been my second scan. 
-hmm. And basically the cancer had shrunk everywhere, but it had grown in my esophagus. So mm -hmm. it was a really weird scan that really sent me down on a negative spiral. So that was tough to deal with. Um, so then I did three more rounds of internal radiation on my esophagus. The radiation, the radiologist said that he couldn't do any more radiation on me because my esophagus would turn to mush. So mm. I, I was maxed out on radiation. And that's when I really went on a journey to learn about metabolic therapy. I watched Dr. Seafried stuff. I just became a sponge because obviously standard of care doesn't work and what the oncologist told me which a lot of people don't realize is your first line chemo you get tremendous results and then it kind of like drops down from there for the second scan and then it doesn't work mm -hmm. anymore so then you go to a second line treatment you might get some results starting here and then it very quickly dwindles down then you go to a third line chemo and you're lucky if it even manages the cancer where you're at and so I quickly realized that standard of care, like I thought it was going to save me, trusted the doctors, but quickly realized that it wasn't going to save me. They gave me three months to live, 12, 12 months with treatment. And that was more like basically a year and a half ago. I'm in better shape now than I was when they gave me that diagnosis. Um, after that, basically, I, I did chemo on and off after that radiation in August, I learned all the stuff. I went on carnivore diet for a bit, um, keto diet for a bit. And then at Christmas, I choked on a cucumber and my um, tumor in my esophagus hemorrhaged. So I spent the, a week in the hospital with it bleeding out of my esophagus. It was coming up. It was really horrible. They did one round of external radiation to coagulate the bleeding. But the uh, radiologist like, we're pushing our limits here, but we got to stop the bleeding. But we got to see mm -hmm. if a surgeon get you in line with a surgeon, because if this happens again, we got to remove the tumor. Long story short, I met with the surgeon. I had been on a keto diet and a carnivore diet. Like kind of, I kind of switched between the two. Even still to this day, I kind of flip flop, and uh, that kind of brings us to today. And my blood work was the best it had ever been. I was in really good shape. So the um, Surgeon recommended getting rid of the tumor now. Well, my hemoglobin was the highest it had ever been. And so I had that surgery done in February. Mm -hmm. They told me no chance of surgery. They told me I had been dead already and I wasn't. And here I am getting this major surgery, getting rid of the main tumor. Right now, there's spots, two spots in my lung, for an example. It's one millimeter and three millimeters, and there's no activity hasn't changed. There's a couple spots on my spine left they're down to one millimeter two millimeters there's spots mm -hmm. all over my liver they're one to three millimeters when we had started these tumors were three to five centimeters so they were quite mm -hmm. massive and wow. they really they really put me down yeah so like i had, so i'm not saying that you shouldn't use standard of care like i'll never recommend that and i'm not going to say that keto diet is the way to go i'm not going to say that um a carnivore diet's the way to go. What I've learned in spending time with Seafried and some of these high-end researchers is that really the goal is to focus on GKI. Whatever gets you mm -hmm. the lowest GKI, that's the food that you should eat. Whatever you have to do in meditation, prayer, and I guess that's going to lead us into the mental side of things. So what I'll, I guess we'll start that off now that I've given my story. I guess I can start that off, me. Just by telling yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, I have like a few questions for you before that, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. I'll let you ask those questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, well, first of all, you know, that's <laughs> a lot of stuff you've been through. Uh, it's pretty crazy, you know, just thinking back, like the whole timeline of what you went through. I mean, it's, it's very traumatic um, having to undergo the surgery and the chemo and the radiation and, uh, having complications and choking on stuff, having to go back to the hospital. And then recently you had another ER visit, right? Um, because you had, um, and they said it was like the, the hiatal muscle or Pol something. Polaris, or, Polaris. Uh, uh, Polaris muscle. Yeah. Got to like, muscle. Constricted and then the food wasn't going through. And so you were just in the hospital last week and then just had another procedure to, uh, for them to stretch it. Right. Yep. That's, yeah, yeah, that's the second complication since the surgery. The first one, um, my large and two thirds of my large intestine pulled through my hiatal muscle, which is really yeah. weird. It was my large intestine, not uh -huh. my small intestine, uh -huh. and in my chest. Uh 
Yeah. And yeah. so they had to go in and they had to re go in everywhere and pull it all down. And then they yeah. take up my hiatal muscle. Yeah. So and that's this, kind of this, like the hernia, like a hernia type yeah. of situation because of that. Yeah. 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 Okay. This one was um, just so severe. They had to fix it. They couldn't leave it. Sometimes with hernia, they can leave it, but this was two thirds yeah. of my intestine and nothing was moving through. So it was kind of urgent that they had to get me in and get that fixed. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's crazy. And I just can't even imagine how hard it is for you to have to eat and, you know, function like that because I mean, they cut out what two, how much of your stomach did they cut out? They cut out half my stomach and they cut uh -huh. out seven centimeters of my esophagus. Uh -huh. And so then they re sewed my stomach back. It's kind of up between my lungs. It's just like a little pouch now. So yeah. it doesn't do that movements or anything when you digest food. It's almost yeah. like food just drops and that yeah. hits you yeah. hard. So I don't get the choking and like throwing up now, but I get after I eat, I have to deal with pain, nausea. Um, yeah. a lot of pain through here my body's adjusting getting reused to things because this whole system from here to the other end all has to work together it all it all yeah. has a role to play and when you take pieces out of it it everything like your pylorus muscle needs to learn how much food it can let through now and mine just overcompensated tightened right up so they just stretch it out 17 centimeters again the, the surgeon yeah. said just to allow stuff through because it was basically closed right up like this and then everything was <laughs> building up causing if we actually had to call 911 because we couldn't manage the pain so yeah yeah no yeah. it's terrible and yeah so and then currently right now um you are on immunotherapy right so they after they stopped the chemotherapy uh did, did they stop it because it was no longer working or like you know what's the story with that and switching to immunotherapy and what treatment are you on now so yeah, that's a that's a good question actually. So I started to have a couple allergic reactions to the chemo. The chemo mm -hmm. uh, regimen I was on 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 document they have no documented cases of anybody going after twelve rounds, and I was able to do seventeen rounds. And I think a big part of that was due to fasting and being on the carnivore diet. I mm -hmm. um, that back in the last fall there. So I did over thirty days of carnivore diet at the worst of it, getting the radiation, restarting the chemo. And like, I was already gone past the recommended amount, but I didn't want the cancer mm -hmm. to go anywhere. And mm -hmm. it did manage the cancer and it stayed at the same size. I got no more shrinkage yeah. from it, but it did manage what my existing symptoms are. But what I learned from Seafeed in that interview is, uh, I forget the name of it, but there's a problem with immune therapy where it works so well that all of the cancer cells die off in 20% mm -hmm. of cases and then that toxicity mm -hmm. actually can kill people and mm -hmm. then in another 20% of cases it works appropriately and then another 60% of cases it does absolutely nothing at all yeah. and so I got I've had no change now I've been off chemo and everything since November I've just been doing immune therapy I kind of am now in the opinion that I'm in that 60% where this immune therapy is doing nothing at all like based on science because there's been no change yeah, so now I'm yeah. kind of thinking, why, why am I doing this? So I'm really going to buckle down and do my own metabolic therapy. I'm going to go for a big fast, uh, 18 days coming up here. I'm really excited because I think I can apply my own techniques like fasting, etc., to beat this cancer on my own. I'm going to have to substitute because of my weight with animal fats during this fast. So I'll just fry up animal fat and eat it and I'll eat, I'll drink Bronbach with butter. Um, your body needs fats in a fast. So whether it's on your body or if you take it in, mm -hmm. that's what it's using to produce the ketones. So you can actually eat animal fats only without interrupting the benefits of a fast. So Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like a fast mimicking diet um, in a way. But yeah, so I, I totally agree with that. And I have the same experience with immunotherapy. And what, what Seafried said was that there are some cases of hyper progression where the That's immunotherapy it. actually, you know, will will make some cases worse, uh, where it speeds up the tumor growth. And I've actually had experience with that uh, with a lot of my um, friends that have uh, alveolar soft part sarcoma that have my type of cancer because we use immunotherapy often for my type of cancer. And in some cases, you know, it's sped up people's tumors. I actually had one friend. Um, that passed away it was so sad you know she was only 23 or so and uh, she was on uh, targeted therapy before that uh, which is another drug that we use and 
it she developed resistance it was no longer working and then she switched over to immunotherapy and it does work for like maybe 20 percent of us and i've had some cases where people have gone into complete remission from it so it's it's actually really great you know but um Uh, but for the other people, it either doesn't work or it sped up their cancer. And so for her, uh, all of her lung metastasis, pleural metastasis grew huge. And she got to the point where she just kept ignoring it, thinking that it was going to work. But it led to her being hospitalized, getting on oxygen. You know, she basically was there for four weeks. And I was talking to her through the whole time until she became delirious and just basically passed away you know so it was four days of me not talking to her until her husband messaged me and said that she passed away so you know it's it's very uh sad you know but immunotherapy can be better than chemotherapy I think you know if it works <laughs> but for me I I think I also fall into that category where it's really not doing anything and so I question myself whether or not I should stay on it I mean I stay on it because I don't have any side effects um, or at least side effects that I can feel. I don't know about you, you know, but um, so for me, it's kind of like, okay, let me just stay on it and see what happens if I don't have any side effects until I do have side effects and then I'll stop it. So I don't Well, know can if you I have ask any, you this? you know, Can I ask yeah. you this? Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I really learned from Seafried that I didn't um, take into consideration before is, and maybe you've done this, but the GKI is the only thing that matters. Mm If you're lowering glucose, you're not feeding the cancer. If you're increasing glucose, you're feeding the cancer at a faster rate. So have you tested your GKI Um, baseline before you did immunotherapy, during immunotherapy, and after immunotherapy by any chance? Well, I've been on immunotherapy this whole time. I've been on it for years. So um, I do not think that it affects my GKI. I mean, the only thing that affects my GKI is what I eat and f it, whether or not I'm fasting. And honestly, it's almost like impossible for me to get my GKI at the one to three level without actually fasting. You know, I'll notice that if I go on a 16 hour fast where I didn't eat, you know, since like 6 p.m. and then I'll test it around 10 or 11 a.m. That's usually when my GKI is the lowest. And then as soon as I eat, even if it's just a ribeye steak, um, it goes right up. So for me, um, I try to use that fasting window Um, and then, of course, you know, eat the, the lowest uh, sugar foods. Uh, but we do have to remember that the cancer uses multiple pathways. It is not just glucose, right? Obviously, glucose is like one of the biggest pathways. But if you've read uh, Jane McClellan's uh, book and her work where she devises this whole metro map um, to target different pathways of the cancer because they use fatty acids, they use amino acids like glutamine and arginine, especially uh, with sarcomas, it's arginine and, um, and then glucose, you know, so you want to block every pathway so that it doesn't have another route to go. Because if you block one pathway, it's going to mutate and change and then it's going to go around it, especially if you have late stage cancer. So I think that's something really, really important um, that we should all know about, you know, that I'm uh, researching more and more about and trying to devise my own metro map. And I've known about her book and I've known about her work for a long time now, but I just haven't really gotten around to doing it because I wanted to do the most minimal thing. But now at this point, um, in this stage in my cancer, I think I have to be more aggressive, you know, so, uh, so that's really important as well. But um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, um, can you let everyone know what else you're doing in terms of uh, the diet? And um, if you feel better on carnivore or keto, or, you know, if plants bother you at all, like I, I know your type of cancer, and, and we're all different. And then if you're taking any drugs or supplements and things like that. Yeah, so um, in terms of metabolic therapy, I'm still learning. Like I got eight months of learning invested in this, and it's a very complicated situation. Um, I'm actually Mm current. -hmm. Right now, my focus is what exactly what is changing my GKI because I'm exactly like you. I can't get into that therapeutic state of GKI, and I'm trying to figure out what's holding my GKI up.
I up. Like I'm having a lot, like this is non-fasting. So I can't get my GKI below five without fasting. Like I'm having a really hard yeah. time. And so I'm now mm -hmm. right now, my goal is to start testing everything. So I'm going to test before I do immunotherapy, my GKI, I'm going to test it after and I'm going to eliminate mm -hmm. everything else. And I'm going to do like one hour after three hour after five hour after, like, I want to get a good baseline. Like, what is this immunotherapy actually doing to my GKI? Because is that mm -hmm. holding me up? Um, I take hydromorphone for pain, especially following the surgery. I take long acting. And so I'm not really mm -hmm. taking short acting at all anymore, unless I'm in a pain mm -hmm. crisis. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to really like, take that back down to almost nothing and i want to see if that's holding on my gki because more morphine base i think well, you're, is more hydromorph is basically a concentrate of morphine correct yeah yeah it's just one form of an opiate pain medication yeah, yeah. and so i'm guessing that would increase my gki i'm gonna test broccoli if i eat broccoli before and after what does it do to my gki i'm taking each and every individual food on its own not with another meal i'm isolating it i'm doing a before gki and an after gki and i don't know maybe a half hour before i test my gki and i wait half hour after i'm done consuming it and i test my gki and i'm gonna and i'm logging what every individual food group does to my gki mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when i'm yeah. on carnivore only, yeah and so to answer your question what I've learned so far is the thing that makes me feel the best is animal fats and carnivore diet. I feel the best. Athletically, I feel the best. Mentally, I feel the best. I can be going through the worst um, radiation and chemo I've ever experienced and at the end of toxicity, and I still feel the best. That was on carnivore diet. But really, I need to know is, well, maybe it's too much carnivore diet's making my GKI go too high. Like, it's I need the answer of what can I eat? What can I consume to maintain my body mass and and maintain where it's at? Maybe even grow it because I've lost 40 pounds mm -hmm. for the, my esophageal cancer. And really, it's about what what can I eat to keep the lowest GKI? Yeah. OK. Yeah. No, that's a great idea. And actually, you know, I just got a continuous glucose monitor. So yes. um, because I've just it, it's really tough to be checking all the time. All I mean, I was time. checking like five times a day and those trips are expensive, <laughs> you know? So mm -hmm. I'm like, and then if you're out and about, it's like, you can't test. And so I, um, I, I have the same mindset as you where I really want to see what types of foods, you know, how, how much it spikes my glucose so that I can adjust it. Um, Cause for me, it's, I, I did try carnivore, but I feel like I did it wrong because I didn't know all of the side effects that could come with it. Um, my hair was falling out. My nails were getting brittle. I, I think I lacked electrolytes, so I had muscle twitches and muscle cramps and all that. And at the time, I had femur mets, uh, metastasis in my bones that were accelerating. So, And it probably had to do with other factors. So I think I might... I mean, right now I'm doing a lot of animal based, you know, I'm eating very clean meats and, but I'm still incorporating some vegetables, very little fruit into my diet. So um, I've been feeling much, much better doing that, just cutting out all of the carbohydrates, you know, like in terms of rice and bread and grains and pasta, like none of those at all, just only, uh, and not even starchy vegetables. So I definitely feel pretty good doing that. So I'm going to stick with that and then see what happens with the, you know, when the glucose monitor comes. That's a great idea. I think you're, I think you're, I think we're both doing really well. And I think the way I see it is once you have cancer um, and you want to go down this path of helping yourself, which I think you mm -hmm. can get more, you can get longer term benefits by doing this stuff than you can from the chemos and radiations and yeah. immunotherapies. But you really become a science experiment. And what, what whatever my um, pr protocol is, I don't think it should be Dr. Nee's protocol. She's a different person. She's a different genetic makeup. Foods are going to affect her differently. And they, some mm -hmm. foods that I eat may not spike my, glu my glucose, but you might eat those foods and they'll spike your glucose. So I think we have to really break it down. We got to eliminate everything and really just start from the scratch and really pick away you got eight years at this so you probably have more figured out than me i um, mean when it comes to carnivore diet in terms <laughs> of doing it yeah <laughs> when it comes to carnivore diet in terms of doing it right or wrong 
Yeah, like if you go carnivore diet away, you need tons of animal fats and you need tons of mm -hmm. salt. Salt and mm -hmm. like salt will help you with the muscle cramps and a lot of that and water, like a lot of salt and water and magnesium. Um, you can yeah. supplement magnesium and you can try it. Like in, and if you fall off a little bit, it's not working. You can adjust the, the diet that you're on or you can add a little bit of things to it to try to compensate mm -hmm. for the issues you're having. Like you could, yeah. like Dr. Saladino, he, he incorporates blueberries with his, he calls yeah. himself a carnivore based. He <laughs> he's, getting a lot of, he's getting a lot of, uh, you know, <laughs> bad, bad breath on the online. Uh, lots of people are calling him out, but you know, he, he has such a different lifestyle um, and he lives in what, like Costa Rica or something. And he, he starts for like three hours a day. <laughs> so it sounds like he needs some carbohydrates, you know? Yeah, and it, he says he feels the best with them, like, and his blood yeah. works in good order, so it's working for him. And so for people to be attacking him for that, it's just craziness. Like, it's working yeah. for him, and that's how he feels the best. At least he's putting in the work and trying. Like, most yeah. people without cancer can't say that for themselves. So it's easier to pick on him than to take your own accountability for your lack of diet and attempt yeah. to next or, no, you know. It's so, so true, yeah, and that's, like, mostly with – with cancer in general, you know, that you have to really take charge of your own health and you can't rely on other people to, I mean, you know, the doctors mean well, um, but you know, they're limited and they're limited to what they can give you and they are training in the standard of care. So they're not gonna go outside of that. I mean, it's your job to uh, research and find out, you know, you just can't sit there. <laughs> and time is of the essence. So you have to just get up and really try to figure out how to live. And, you know, many people have done it. So I just constantly watch survivor stories and listen to people who have survived cancer. And that's my inspiration, you know, um, mm. like talking to people like you and uh, developing relationships so that we can encourage each other and talk about things that work and things that don't, you know? Um, so, yeah. So, uh, and I think you're also taking fenbendazole, right? And I'm taking menbendazole, yeah. similar version. So we're both on that. Yeah, we are. We're both. A, so I'm looking at actually doing this long fast coming up. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking of, I might have a way of getting embendazole. I think I found a link online. So mm -hmm. I'm going to attempt to get some embendazole. And what I think I'm going to do is take fembendazole in the morning and embendazole at night. So it's an aggressive dose. But I'm going to do this while I, I do my upcoming 18-day fast. I'm going to do an 18-day fast starting June 1st to June 18th. And it's going to be, mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to maintain my weight. So it's going to be a uh, homemade bone broth with uh, like three or four tablespoons of butter. Each tablespoon of butter mm -hmm. is 100 calories. So I'll drink five or six of those a day to keep my calories up. I'll fry up uh, pure animal fat, cut them up into little squares and fry them up. It'll, yeah, apparently it's kind of like bacon. So it won't, shouldn't taste too mm. bad. I'm going to eat that. Um, and that's going to mm. be my 18 day fast. And I'm going to, my protocol is going to be berberine three times a day, 500 milligrams to lower glucose morning, lunch, and evening. Yeah. I'm going to take the fembendazole in the morning and bendazole at night. If I can get some, if not, I'll go fem and fem doesn't matter morning and night which is aggressive like i know i get it that's an aggressive treatment but like i'm already into it hopefully a deep state of gki like that's the best time to be aggressive yeah. and really it's, put it's pressure not, on those yeah, cancer it's, cells it's not that aggressive i mean definitely people no. have taken that you know i mean twice a day versus once a day versus taking it four days on three days off i mean it's uh but the uh, you know the the dose that you would need to be very toxic is like a crazy amount you know so i it's it's as long as you're monitoring your liver function tests i think you should be fine yeah and i get that i they to do my blood work uh every three weeks so i mean 18 days I, i'm just doing this for 18 days so i'm sure i'll be fine yeah i'll probably have a yeah. test in the well, middle i think great. i have an appointment yeah, I think I have a point, a test in the middle. So yeah, I got berberine. I'm going to do fembendazole and embendazole aggressively. Um, what else was I going to take? Oh, I was going to take quercetin, which uh, I don't know mm -hmm. if you know about quercetin, but I, I'm not even sure about yeah. it. Just it helps create new cells, basically. Helps generate new cells. So so when you're fasting, you there's a big recell generation process like and there's autopathy and mytopathy 
all that stuff. So I think having, I think dose and quercetin, the people, adults are taking like 4,000 milligrams a day of quercetin. And so I'm going to aggressively take quercetin three times a day, 500 milligrams, Mm -hmm. maybe even a thousand milligrams three times a day. So like 3000 milligrams of quercetin. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what I'm going to take there. Um, What else am I going to do? Quercetin. What about like like curcumin? I mean, that's part of the Joe Tippins protocol um the curcumin yeah yeah you can get curcumin extract capsules so um that's yeah. on the list i haven't gone to buy it yet yeah. um that yeah. i gotta i gotta go buy that and and niceton are the two things i need to go and buy that i've been yeah. procrastinating um, <laughs> that's, no, that's no, it <laughs> yeah um so cur- curcumin cur- yeah. right cur- Human. Yeah, yeah. Like, so. and like they're human, yeah, different forms. But um, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, so that's that's um, it's great what you're doing, and I can't wait to hear how how you do after the fast. And fasting is just so beneficial for cancer with autophagy, mm-hmm. and I mean, there's there's mm-hmm. so many benefits of fasting. I can make a whole separate video about that. But yeah, so now let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about you know some of the emotional things and. Um, you know, maybe what you thought might have caused your cancer and um, the different things that you've done, you know, to help with your mental health. Yeah, so I think that this side of it is something that we don't talk about very much in the cancer world. It's all about diet and metabolic therapy and all this stuff. But when talking to Professor Seafried, he made it very clear that it's not it's not just about the diet or a ketogenic diet. It's about GKI. And stress, anger, all of that stuff is a major player in what your GKI levels are going to be. You're going to get spikes in glucose if you're not keeping your mind straight. So I guess a great thing to say on that one is a lot of people go around and say, oh, stay positive, stay strong. And when you have cancer, it's really like a blanket statement because it's like, you know what? I got the biggest problem in my life. They just told me I'm going to be dead mm-hmm. in three months. And you're telling me to be positive. How are you supposed to be? I guess number one, how's that positive? Like what positivity is there? Number two, um, it's like, what good is it going to do for me? And and the answer is actually a lot of good, but nobody can provide a reason as to why. And and I guess maybe we can cover that right now. Um, the reason why being positive and staying strong, keeping your mind straight is such a beneficial thing to fighting cancer is because it keeps your glucose low. If you keep your glucose low, Cancer doesn't have any energy to grow. And that's just the bottom line. So there is truth to those sayings. And we hear it all the time. And it does get frustrating. But it's because it has no direction. It has no meaning. It's like, and there's no solution. So maybe we can get into some of those things here today. But you have to keep your stress in order. You have to keep your blood pressure down. You have to keep your glucose down. And so that's why it's, it's, it's as important as metabolic therapy, as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. And I completely agree with that because uh, stress releases cortisol, which is a stress hormone in your body, and then that's going to cause the sugar spike. And you can, you know, people have measured it, you know, and I'm, and that's another reason why I kind of want to get the <laughs> continuous glucose monitor because I want to see what things are triggering me mentally and not just with the food. That way I can identify it and I can find ways to to relax and to calm down different methods that I can actually get it to be better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so can you think of any reason why, why do you think you got the cancer in the first place? Yeah. So that was your first question. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, we, my wife owned a hair salon. We had 21 employees uh, going through COVID lockdowns was an extremely stressful time. Mm-hmm. And so that stress on the mitochondria, like you can't believe how stressful that was laying off your staff four or five times being closed 12 mm-hmm. out of 24 months, no government subsidies. Like our salon's 4,500 mm-hmm. square feet. I'm sitting in the office right now and we got no government subsidies. We lost everything we had. So that, wow. that stress load was unbearable. And so mm-hmm. that could have played a huge role in this. And then the other question is, well, like, cause I'm young and healthy back then um i was always on the go active wasn't partying all the time like like, yeah i would go out once in a while it was rare like once in like three months would i maybe go out and have some beers with my friends like it was rare um so 
the only real thing is that or COVID itself, like viruses do cause cancer. Um, mm -hmm. There's like human papilloma, HPV, human papilloma virus. It's a cancer yeah. causer. I think there's some hepatitis that cause cancer in the liver. Am I right? No, yeah. Oh, there's, there's a lot. Yeah. Definitely have hepatitis B and C. Uh, that's actually how my dad passed away. Um, he had liver cancer secondary to hepatitis C, which led to cirrhosis, which led to the uh, hepatocellular cancer and sarcomas, uh, which is what I have, <laughs> interestingly, mm. um, can also be caused by viruses. And there's like a, a herpes virus, um, you know, the Kaposi sarcoma is another one that HIV patients get. Um, so there's there's definitely uh, a role to that. And, and I, you know, and I'll talk about it later, but I think that part of that is, is part of uh, why I developed cancer, you know, and, and it's not just viruses, it's other pathogens too, like parasites and bacteria and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what caused my cancer? It could have been something to do with COVID. It could have been the stress from co uh, COVID mm -hmm. lockdowns or, or it could have been the COVID vaccine. A lot of people in the comments are going to jump to, oh, did you got the COVID vaccine? Well, it could have been like, I'm not going to say it wasn't. I don't, but the reality is, is I have no evidence. I have no proof. Yeah. Um, I'm 35 years old with esophageal cancer. Like you don't get esophageal cancer until you're in your sixties. Like they can't believe a 35 year old has it. So it was definitely something new in the environment that is causing this because there's more and more younger patients every day yeah. coming in with these cancers that old people have. And maybe it's the processed mm -hmm. food generation that we grew up with. Maybe that's why. Like, that's definitely a question. Yeah. yeah. And you, I mean, you weren't a smoker, right? Like, were you, did you use tobacco? On and off, but not a lot. And like, and even if you were like, I'm 35, like you're talking yeah. and like, you got, yeah. you got a million pieces of data that, that still is an accumulative thing until you're 60. So uh, smoking yeah. had nothing to yeah, do with it. Mm -hmm. Like on off like yeah. parties and then I'd, I'd have yeah. periods where I would smoke and then quit again. Like, but I, I didn't consistently smoke. I, I wouldn't call myself a smoker. Like I smoked very little over the last 10 years like very little I, like if you were to say how much did you smoke over the last 10 years i bet you if you were to add it all up put together it'd be less than two years so mm -hmm. that's not causing esophageal cancer in a 35 year old no it's so true and i and i think it might have just been the perfect storm you know um because a lot of times i think you get predisposed to it and then in the right environment and with the right triggers that's usually how it comes about. I mean, that's uh, diseases in general and especially cancer. So, um, you know, for me, it was a, a combination of being in medical school at the time. I was an intern. Uh, it was my first year of residency. And then my dad got sick. Um, you know, he got diagnosed with cancer and it was so much stress for me to go back and forth to visit him at the hospital. I was five hours away, uh, you know, and I had to uh, be in residency, you can't really take time off. You're working 80 hours a week and you're working six days a week, most weeks. So I would only be able to go home maybe twice a month to see him on the weeks that I work five days. And I remember just leaving the clinic right after work and just driving straight up to Syracuse from Long Island. And I was falling asleep on the wheel. I was just so tired, but I went anyway. And then I would stay there for the weekend, drive home Sunday, back to work Monday, and it was just like that rinse and repeat. And I couldn't take time off of work because it was, uh, I would have had to repeat a whole year. So I just did that until he passed away. And on the night that he passed away, I was in Long Island and I couldn't even get there. So I had to get up and just drive in the middle of the night while he was dying in the hospital. And that was so traumatic for me, you know, to lose my dad like that when he was in the hospital dying and I, I couldn't be there. And the grief of all that, uh, and especially with how much I looked up to my dad and how much he played a role in my life, losing him like that and the grief of it, I really feel like contributed to my cancer development because it was right after that that I felt the lump in my um, right side. And that was, uh, it grew for like three years before I got it checked out. And then after that, it was more stress and, you know, finishing up residency, 
planning my wedding. Um, so it was just a lot of, mm -hmm. of things that kind of culminated, I think, you know, to then finally trigger that. And it probably, I probably had the cancer in my body for years and we all have cancer cells. It's just that our immune system takes care of it, right? But what happens to the immune system when you have overwhelming grief and sadness and stress is it, it shuts down, it's not working properly. And so all of that creates this perfect storm and then you get cancer. So, yeah, so I think it's really important for people to kind of, you know, if they are diagnosed with cancer or diagnosed with a chronic illness to think about the factors that played a role in it. And then once you identify those factors, then you can try and heal, right? Because if you don't know and you're not aware of what's causing something, then you're just kind of blindly repeating the same patterns. And so you really have to dig deep in order to really heal from the inside out. So I think that's so important. Yeah, it's very important. And um, there's many ways that you can work with your mind like there's meditation there's float de sensory deprivation tanks work wonders mm -hmm. i don't know if people have heard of those yes, the float, the float um, tanks i've done that yeah <laughs> they're amazing they're amazing they really can set your mind at ease um there's prayer if you if you believe in prayer you can use prayer um there's things like uh there's you could see a therapist sometimes people get great help from that sometimes they they don't but i think I think it's a good start at least you're doing something uh there's psychedelic psychotherapy you can look into things like that that have tremendous impact and they have hundreds of studies on that one um if yeah yeah well that's you know, that. yeah and i know that you've uh you've done that because you live in canada and it's um legal there and that's really awesome and, and we did an interview uh, together on that recently um so yeah so definitely i, I want you to share your experience and what you think about that and how it would help yeah so if you go to so before you just jump to the conclusion oh no dr knee's talking about drugs like just don't like <laughs> before you go that far like just give it a second we got thousands of people here that have done these these experiences at at um nyu and john hopkins university and we got tons of studies okay and they got thousands of thousands of cancer end of life patients, war vets, all depression, addiction, all kinds of people, thousands, tens and tens of thousands of people now. And the results are like 80% or higher. Like they're even using Ibogaine to treat opiate addiction and 80% success rate. And we're in the middle of an opiate pandemic. So just let's just not just dismiss this thing, okay? Like alcohol is fine, no problem. Go out, get drunk. Like people can have beers. It's like so destructive, destroying families. But when it comes to psychedelic psychotherapy, like we're talking like one time, large dose use with in a safe set and setting with a professional. And what that does for you is it allows you the opportunity to. Well, in my case, I was facing my own death. Like I was gonna die. Like, I got a two-year-old and a five-year-old. I got a beautiful wife. Like, I love my life. I'm not ready to die. Like, I I want to see my kids grow up. Like, this isn't, like, and what that does to you is it totally tears you apart. Like, I just, I can't, everybody watching this, like, can you imagine how that would tear you apart mentally? Yeah, so here, have six beers. That's one option. That's the socially acceptable option. Well, what's that going to do for you? It's just going to depress you further. It might like numb you for a few moments, but then you're going to feel worse. Like it, that's no good. Well, here's another option. You get approved by Health Canada. You go sit down with a couple professionals. You have a few sessions where they prepare you. You have a four hour session where you take the medicine. Mm -hmm. And when I took the medicine, I went in there with the intent, intent of facing my own mortality. And I got to go, I got this wonderful opportunity where I got to go on a journey of the universe and I got to see life I got to see death how it was given taken and I got to experience every single human emotion that you can think of towards the end in an overwhelming amount like I've never been so sad in my life I've never felt so much joy in my life I've never felt so much gratitude in my life like it was 
it was so much like it was more than just a feeling of these human emotions it was significantly mm -hmm. more than that and I got to mourn for myself and I cried for over an hour like it was it was crazy and I got to let go of all these stresses and and they're that was back in October and they're still gone to, the, to this day and so now like my my stress level and anxiety level is down more than 80%. Well, you get that down more than 80%. Like, what is that doing to your GKI? Like, it's, it has a tremendous benefit. So they just did a study in Canada where 68 people took psilocybin with a guided psychiatrist. And they were all into life six months to live. Like, these people weren't going to be alive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was three years ago. Four have passed away. That's it. Now, I'll explain that to me because modern medicine over the last 50 years when it comes to cancer has improved by 5%. These chemos and treatments and surgeries have increased your odds of living by 5% over 50 years. That's it. That's it. 68 people, six months to live. Three years later, 64 of them are alive. Now, explain that to me. Yeah. It has it's to be crazy. Yeah, it has to be the psychedelic experience and the mindset. And so back when when we were talking earlier, I said when people say stay strong, you know, be positive. It's the right advice, but it's bad advice because it provides us with no guidance. It provides us with like, oh, just just be strong. Well, you just got the biggest problem in your life. You've just been given a death sentence, essentially. You're going to die. Hey, you, you're going to die very shortly. And in the next three months, if you don't do, do what I say, you're dead. That's literally what they say to you. And they're not, they're not soft about it. <laughs> like it's not, these doctors, these oncologists are not gentle. They're not like, Hey, Jay, you doing okay. Unfortunately, we're in this situation where, you know, but we're going to figure it out. We're going to work through it. No, no. They read it from the straight from the paper. They barely look at you. So, metastases stage four in liver five centimeter tumors uh prognosis no treatment you'll be dead within three months or sooner like this is really advanced like you're palliative like that's it you get some treatment there's there's a chance you might make it a year mm -hmm. you'll be lucky you'll be lucky jay that's like that's how they treat you they're that yeah. blunt like i don't know have you experienced them like are they not that blunt about I it I, I don't even ask my doctor. <laughs> I don't ask them about the prognosis at all, but it's funny because they referred me to palliative care and I have a palliative care doctor, but they're like, oh no, it's just, you know, it's, it's just for you to have more support and things like that. But I mean, I, I know what they're thinking, you know, but I think, um, they know I'm a doctor myself and, um, they treat me differently, uh, because of that. And, you know, so they tend to let me be a little bit more independent about my treatment choices. They are more supportive. I mean, I'm I'm lucky to have that, you know, to be able to access a lot more and to talk to my doctor more in like a a, a different manner. You know, although I, I want to be a patient and not <laughs> not to have my, to be my own doctor, but I think it's a little bit different. And then with my cancer, um, it is really just hit or miss, you know, I mean, the five year survival is supposed to be 10%, uh, 10 to 30%, depending on if you get surgery or not, and if you know, where the tumors actually grow. So I, I passed that point, I'm like almost eight years now. So my doctor, I really don't think actually knows what my prognosis is. So it's crazy, they don't know what your prognosis is after the like, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Because it's lagging a little bit. How do they know? How, the doctor, from, just... Professor Seafried said it best. How can they tell you when you're going to die? It's like, oh, Jason, your wife is going to die in 2063 on Wait, May Jason. 2nd. Yeah. Jason, can you hear me? Yep. You're, you're lagging a little bit. I'm lagging. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're, I don't know if it's your internet or mine, but I, it's completely lagging. So you. Yes, uh, sorry guys. I don't know what happened to our internets, but um, it was a little laggy. So we had to 
fix that. But uh, but anyway, I was just talking about my uh, prognosis and how my oncologist, I think, just really doesn't know. Um, and, and so for me, I, I don't care uh, what the prognosis is and what it says on paper. Um, I'm, I'm my own person and nobody can tell me how long I have to live. You know, only God knows. So I think that's kind of how we all should approach things. And the oncologists, you know, they're just doing their jobs. They don't want to give you false hope and they don't want to tell patients that, you know, this is going to happen when it's not. So I think um, it's really just how they have to do their jobs, you know. Yeah, that's how they have to do their jobs. And they're reading from, a, they have a set. Mm -hmm. procedure they have to follow and they can't yep. they can't go outside of that I think yep. and I think that's like you well you work as a family doctor so uh, you yeah. probably understand how those guidelines work a lot better than the rest of us but yeah and they it's, have it's to do mm -hmm. so those procedures says Jason with esophageal cancer that's metastasized he's gonna live three months well Jason's 35. It's not 70. Like there's so many variables in this stuff. So if you, if you, if you're out there and you're given a horrible prognosis too, I mean, there's so many things you can do to change that prognosis and you could live forever. Like it's there, like maybe based on your lifestyle, maybe you got three months to live, but you got great motivation to make a dr drastic improvement here. So don't let it get down on you and, and, and really make a big strive to improve yourself. And if you do that, that prognosis, like that, that now changes. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of it has to do with fear. You know, when you first get that diagnosis, it's like instantly that fear kicks in and we know what fear does to our body. So I think, you know, when you first get diagnosed, uh, the most important thing is to empower yourself, because if you know that there's a reason why you might have developed the cancer rather than thinking, oh, this happened to me is just a genetic mutation and it has nothing to do with what I did and you don't take any ownership for your own illness. Um, that's in a way very disempowering, right? Because then there's nothing you can do about it and, and everything is in somebody else's hand and they have to, uh, you know, they have to save you rather than you doing anything about it. So I think approaching it from the perspective where there are things that can be done empowers you and then you can then go and do something about it to make yourself better, even if it's just improving your quality of life. Absolutely. Um, and for me, it was really the psychedelic experience that made the drastic difference. It allowed me to go inside go deep and it allowed my psych subconscious mind to really come forward mm -hmm. and really allow me to see each and every piece that was causing my anxiety and fear. And it allowed me to let go of those stressors permanently and forever. Um, it was very tough to do. It's not for everybody, but if you have the courage to take the dose and if you have the courage to seek out a professional guide and go through the process, and if you have the willpower to document the experience and to meditate back on it, it can yield astronomical benefits in dealing with these fears and stressors, which it's looking like to me can cause you the have a symptom of a longer life going forward due to the reduced glucose uptake to the cancer and growing the cancer. Yeah. That's, that's what I took from professor Seafried. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, it sounds like a super powerful experience and it helped you tremendously, um, you know, and then now you can kind of be more calm and more methodical in dealing with your cancer versus just being in this, constant fight or flight state where you're just in fear and anxiety and depression. And so when you're in that state, you can't think clearly, you can't do anything, you're, you're debilitated, you know? So mm -hmm. for me, the mind work has been one of the most important. It's, I think it's the most important and the key factor to healing and to staying alive. I mean, you can do all the right things with your diet and you can exercise and you can do all you know take all the supplements do take the drugs but if your mindset is not right you're not going to be motivated to do these things and you're not going to be motivated to live you know not every 
somebody with cancer actually wants to live and they don't even know that themselves, you know, and they've already given up. So I think those of us that survive have this will to live and to really uh, find ways to solve these problems. So on that note, the people that maybe if you're listening to this, you're lucky enough to hear this and you're one of the people that don't have the will to live, maybe this can help you out. Uh, at least some of you, I think a huge number of people in that, that set of the, the population of individuals with cancer, I think their biggest issue is standard of care. They don't want to go through the chemo, the radiation, the surgeries. Um, if you're in that segment, there are more options to help you. You don't necessarily have to go through that. Like you can just use metabolic therapy. You can change your lifestyle you can make yourself feel better and live out the remaining days that you have left feeling much better. Like the first thing to do is to cut out the sugar and the carbs. And then the next thing to do is to get some light exercise. You don't need to exercise a lot because you get the quarry cycle. If you use excess exercise um, and just reducing glucose alone and applying some simple things, things and uh, maybe considering taking low doses of chemo if you're in that segment that's like I can't I don't want to do any of this it's too sick it's too hard I can't do it well maybe just doing a small dose of chemo is an option with applying more metabolic therapy like maybe that's one of ten people don't have don't want to live but maybe maybe that's enough advice to help those maybe it's two out of ten people like more metabolic therapy and less standard of care maybe that is what you need to hear and what you need to know is an option. And maybe that'll allow you to carry on with this horrible illness. So I just thought there was an idea that popped in my head that when you said that, I thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, yeah, no, it's so true. And I think um, it really just takes courage. You know, it's like that first step uh, that you take that's the hardest. And that's what I find is, is you know, it gets exponential after that. It, it kind of builds and it's like a snowball effect. So if you're able to put mm -hmm. one step, one foot in front of the other and just get started, um, you know, that that's the biggest step that you need to take. So, you know, um, I, I definitely think this, hopefully this is very encouraging to people who are dealing with the same thing with cancer, chronic illnesses, everything. Um, you know, we're approaching almost an hour, so um, probably time to wrap it up. But um, Jason, I mean, it's been so wonderful to talk to you. I mean, I, I love how we, you know, communicate um, off offline and, and we talk all the time and um, you're really inspiring. You encourage me and hopefully I encourage you. And that's really, you know, what this is about. Um, we all need each other and we all need to learn from one another to see, um, what you're doing, what I'm doing, what works, you know, just put our heads together because two is better than one. So <laughs> thank you so much for coming on to my channel. And um, I look forward to having more interviews with you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It was a pleasure to be here. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, I will post uh, Jason's uh, channel below and, you know, I'll probably do an interview on his as well, as I said. And so I um, would love it if you guys uh, commented on what you thought and um, any questions you might have. And uh, please, you know, check out Jason's channel. Okay. All right. Have a good day. y'all. Bye.